Welcome to lecture 17. In lecture 15 I had promised you an example of how to utilize the equation for calculating the center of mass of a system. And so finally um, after taking a detour in lecture 16 to do a two-dimensional conservation of momentum problem I'm going to make good on that promise and we are going to calculate the center of mass of a water molecule. So uh, based upon the information that you see here, this actually turns out to be enough to do this task. Uh, the shape of a water molecule is as indicated here with this cartoon, sort of at an angle with the um, heavier oxygen atom at the center and then these smaller hydrogen atoms off at angles as you see here. So if I want to draw this in two dimensions on a coordinate system, I can go ahead and um, put my oxygen atom right here at the origin. And then the hydrogen atoms I will put here and here. Uh, based upon the information given in the problem, all of these things are equidistant can approximate them as such. Okay, so this is a distance r and this is a distance r. Now the angle in between these two vectors here is uh, what's indicated here as 105 degrees. So with respect to the y-axis, um, the smaller angle here is going to be uh, 52 and a half degrees. Okay, so to remind you, our formula to compute the center of mass is going to be uh, this sum in the numerator divided by the total mass of the system in the denominator. And so for this, we're going to look both in the x direction and the y direction. In the x direction, the symmetry, hopefully you can see that the symmetry of the situation is going to put the location of the x center of mass right at the origin. Okay, uh, this um, hydrogen atom is just as far away from the center, uh, from the y-axis as this hydrogen atom and this oxygen atom is situated right at the origin. Um, another way to think about it is that the x components of these vectors are effectively cancel, right? So uh, for all of those reasons then we can conclude that we don't really need to do anything to compute the x center of mass, it just turns out to be zero. Okay, if you wanted to actually do that computation you could uh, plug in r times uh, the sine of 52 and a half degrees since that's measured with respect to the y-axis into this equation uh, and you would be able to conclude that all these terms vanish. Okay, um, and so then what we need to know is how far up the y-axis will our center of mass be. And so for that direction we're going to sum up um, each of these three masses and their distance from the origin um, in the y direction, right? How far up above the origin are they? And then we're going to divide by the total mass, this one plus this one plus this one. So what I'm saying then is that for the oxygen atom, that term in my sum here will be the mass of oxygen times what? Well, it's located at the origin, so it's uh, multiplied by zero here. Uh, so that term is going to vanish. Uh, then to that I've got to add these two are going to be the same height right above the origin so I can multiply by two here since there are two of these or I can think about adding one and then adding the identical term and this will be the mass of hydrogen times R cosine of that 52 degrees. Let me make this a little smaller so that it'll fit better. 
Okay, and then we're going to divide the entire thing by the total mass of our water molecule, which will consist of the mass of the oxygen atom plus the mass of the hydrogen atom plus another mass of the hydrogen atom. Okay, when I plug in all of these values, which by the way, I can actually keep this in um, these units here rather than worrying about uh, converting to kilograms here because I've got this, them appearing both in the numerator and the denominator, so the units, it's really just the proportionality that matters. Um, but in the end, if you crunch through all of the numbers, what you should find is that the Y center of mass is going to be located um, only 6.5 times 10 to the minus 12 meters from the origin, which means that it's not very far up above this origin here. Uh, it might be somewhere right about here. Okay, just close to that oxygen atom since it is the most massive in the water molecule. Okay, and so we talked about how the center of mass becomes relevant when we're thinking about um, explosions and how, for example, with the plate, the center of mass just sort of stayed there. These things all canceled. Or if you were, um, if you had something that was in motion and then it exploded, you would see that the center of mass continues on this path. If you were to add up all of these little momentum vectors, uh, then you would see that the center of mass effectively travels as it would have if it hadn't exploded. Okay, so with that discussion of center of mass, we can basically um, review all of the things that we've talked about with momentum in unit three here. So we started by defining momentum as being a vector quantity, which is proportional to the mass and also proportional to the velocity of an object. And we also said that um, there was a related quantity called impulse that had to do with the net force on an object uh, applied over a certain time. And the impulse momentum theorem then told us that this impulse is equal to the change of momentum. And we said that uh, the law of conservation of linear momentum tells us that when there are no external forces at work on a system, then it's um, momentum is conserved, meaning that the change of momentum from initial to final state is equal to zero. And finally, we uh, learned how to compute where the center of mass was located uh, for a system of objects. Okay, so let's go through uh, a few quick examples of each of these one by one, and that will effectively wrap up our uh, unit four discussion of momentum. So getting back to collisions, let's review. Um, let's suppose that I throw a ball against a wall. If it has a, an initial speed, which is completely in the horizontal direction as it collides with the wall, um, then it's going to bounce back off of the wall um, with a certain velocity that is in the opposite direction, uh, but you see that it is less than what it started with. Okay, so this is an example of an inelastic collision. If the uh, collision were entirely elastic, I would expect this to be the same value as that. Okay, now knowing that, we can still compute what the change of momentum actually was, and uh, therefore using the impulse momentum theorem, equate this to the impulse uh, that that was on the wall. So the change of momentum in this case uh, will be the mass times the change of velocity since the mass did not change. Uh, but we need to be careful here. The incoming velocity was pointing in this direction and the outgoing velocity was pointing in that direction. So by how much did the velocity actually change? It had to go from 30 meters per second all the way down to zero and then backwards 20 meters per second. That represents a change of 50 meters per second. Uh, mathematically speaking, you could write that out as um, 30 meters per second in the positive x direction minus 
negative 20 meters per second in the negative x direction. So this is a change of 50 meters per second. So the um, change of momentum then will be the mass of the ball, which is equal to 0 0.4 kilograms times this 50 meters per second, which gives us an impulse equal to 20 newton seconds. Choice A. All right. Since we know this impulse, we can use the definition of impulse. We arrived at the impulse through the impulse momentum theorem, but we can go back to the definition of impulse where it's going to equal the force times the time, and then we can know something about the average force that was exerted here. Uh, solving for that force and plugging in what we know uh, from the previous slide, which was that 20 newton seconds was the impulse, and the time over which the collision took place, 0 0.01 seconds, then I find a force of 2,000 newtons, choice D. So this is the kind of argument that is used for different safety measures in your uh, vehicle. If you have some sort of collision, then uh, what would be one way to reduce the force um, onto your body? Well, this force could be reduced by changing the impulse, but you may not be able to do that because you might have a certain momentum change that is going to take place regardless in the type of collision that you're involved in. Uh, but another way to reduce this force would be to increase this denominator. Instead of it taking 0.01 seconds, what if it took 0.1 seconds? Then we would only be dealing with 200 newtons of force instead of 2,000. Uh, so that is the effect that things like seat belts and airbags do in a car collision. They make the collision take longer uh, so that the force on your body is less. Okay, so I think we've exhausted some, our examples of collisions for now. Uh, I want to talk about effectively explosion type scenarios in which you start with uh, an initial momentum that it's equal to zero and then you have objects splitting off in different directions like we did with the dish. We'll just constrain ourselves to a couple more one-dimensional examples of this. So let's suppose you have um, these two people here, a man and a woman, pushing off of one another in one dimension. What is their initial momentum? Their initial momentum is equal to zero if they're at rest to start with. And their final momentum uh, in the is, and we're keeping this in one dimension is going to be equal to the mass of the man times the velocity of the man plus the mass of the woman times the velocity of the woman. Okay, so if I want to know then what the um, what the final velocity of the woman is, I can algebraically rearrange this here and the mass of the man times the velocity of the man divided by the mass of the woman should equal my final velocity for my woman and that turns out to be, if you plug in the numbers in the problem, um, that turns out to be 3.9 meters per second. Now I realize I'm going through these relatively quickly. It's because we've done similar examples to these before and hopefully now you're proficient and able to uh, get to the point of solving these relatively straightforwardly. Okay, so the last example for this unit will be our astronaut that is in peril. Um, this scenario involves an astronaut who has become untethered from the spacecraft and all she's got is her, her um, oxygen tank with her. If she chucks the op oxygen tank in the opposite direction from the spacecraft, she can perhaps hope to uh, go towards the spacecraft based on this idea of conservation of momentum, just as the previous people pushed off of one another, she can effectively do that. And if she is not too far away from the spacecraft, maybe she will not run out of oxygen before she arrives.
So that's the setup. So it's starting out the same as uh, the previous example where the initial momentum we're going to take to be zero and we're going to treat this in one dimension. And the final momentum then is going to be equal to um, m1 v1 as indicated here we're using one for the astronaut um, plus m2 v2 these must be equal to one another the initial and the final Okay, and when we solve the equation, we will get the same expression that we had in the previous slide. Just different subscripts here. Okay, um, and then what we'll be able to determine it then is that her velocity is 1.28 meters per second as she's heading towards the spacecraft. So that's all well and good. It tells me the speed with which she's traveling towards the spacecraft. But the question was, can she actually survive? But we know something about velocity uh, when it comes to time and distance, right? So velocity being equal to distance times time, if we know the velocity and we know the time, we can then solve for the distance. So the maximum distance she could be in order to, uh, you know, not run out, uh, not run longer than the two minutes that is required uh, for her survival would be uh, this velocity times that two minutes making sure that I convert two minutes into 120 seconds and I would find then that she could be approximately 153 meters away uh, and still have some hope of survival. Uh, just FYI, when astronauts are out on space spacewalks, they do not have a single tether tethering them in. So this is an unlikely scenario. There's always redundancies and safety measures in place. Um, nevertheless, it's an interesting one to look at. Um, and that wraps up our discussion of momentum. Next, uh, next lecture, we will begin discussing Unit 5, where we'll start to talk about rotation.